You need compute services like virtual machines and app service to host your applications. It's highly likely your applications also need to store and retrieve data. SQL Server is an extremely popular way for applications to store and retrieve relational data. You could install SQL Server on an Azure virtual machine, but wouldn't it be nice to not have to worry about the server part of SQL Server? My name is Eric Boyd. I'm an Azure MVP, a Microsoft Regional Director, and the founder of ResponsiveX, where we help customers run workloads and develop applications in Azure. Azure has a great platform as a service or PaaS offering for SQL Server databases called Azure SQL Database. With Azure SQL Database, you get access to a database server and can deploy your databases into Azure, but you don't have to manage any SQL Server infrastructure. Azure takes care of this for you. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can quickly get started with Azure SQL Database. The Azure SQL Database service lets you create databases in seconds without having to take care of any infrastructure or manage software updates. And like the Azure App Service I created in the video of this series titled Getting Started with Azure App Service, you get some free options and offers. As part of the free account offer, you get 250 gigabytes of SQL Database for free. If you want to learn more about the free account offer, I'd encourage you to check out the video in this series titled Maximizing Your Free Account Benefits. To create a SQL Database in Azure, I could create it from the portal. I could use Azure Resource Manager templates. I could use the command line tools or even create a database from SQL Server Management Studio. In this video, I'm going to create a database using the portal. To get to the portal, I'll navigate to portal.azure.com in my web browser. I'll click Create a Resource from the Database category. I'll choose SQL Database. I'll select a subscription and resource group first. Then I'll give it a name. And I'll click Create New to create a new server. I'll name it, select the region for this new SQL Database server, configure the authentication method as SQL Authentication, and enter an admin credential. Next, I will click Configure Database next to Compute and Storage. This will allow me to configure the performance and pricing of this database. In the Service Tier dropdown, you will see two groups, vCore and DTU. The vCore model stands for Virtual CPU Cores. Under vCore, you will see several options, including General Purpose Hyperscale and Business Critical. The DTU model stands for Database Throughput Units. It's the previous model for pricing and performance, and it's a relative model that's an abstraction over the hardware characteristics. You provision 10 DTUs, 50 DTUs, 100 DTUs, and that's a combination of things like CPU, memory, network I.O., and disk I.O. And then you monitor and see what your usage is and scale as appropriate. There's nothing wrong with the DTU model, but I would encourage you to check out the vCore model. The vCore model is a lot more familiar for most of us, where we're thinking about hardware, the number of CPU cores, the amount of drive capacity, the amount of memory and network I.O. And the vCore model is where the new investment and in features are being delivered. I'm going to select general purpose, and then you can see we can select an option for compute tier, uh, which are the provisioned or serverless options. Provisioned is where I have resources that are carved out for me. I'm going to pay for them whether I use them or not. Serverless means that I don't have resources dedicated to me. Instead, they will auto scale and I'll pay for a per second cost based on the amount of vCores that I use. I'm going to choose provisioned and I assume most will because that's what they're most familiar with. But as you get going, you might also choose serverless. Serverless provides for really cost effective ways to run SQL, especially for dev test scenarios where you're not needing the database always on at some maximum capacity. I've selected two CPU cores and 32 gigs of max size, and I'm going to press the Apply button. I will also select Geo-Redundant Backup Storage, so that if there's a regional outage, I'll be able to restore from the paired region where the backups are replicated. I'll press Review and Create, which will show me the summary of what I'm about to create, and then press the Create button to start the deployment. Now this can take several seconds to a couple of minutes, so we will let this deploy. While it's deploying, I want to explain a few things about that configuration in more detail. The first being that I created a server. 
And I did tell you right before this that Azure SQL Database is great because you don't have to manage infrastructure and software updates. But I did create a SQL Database server. And you need a server. You need a place to create your database. You need a place to centrally manage your databases. You might want to manage things like SQL logins that are shared across multiple databases. So the server gives you a place to do that. You need a place to connect into as well, to connect to those databases. So that's what that server is there for. But you don't have to manage anything. In fact, you don't have any access to see a server console. It's fully managed by Microsoft. And what's behind SQL Database Server is multiple nodes. What you essentially have is always on availability groups running your SQL Database Server behind the scenes. Several nodes highly available. You don't have to think about configuring all of that yourself. My database has deployed, and I'm going to click the Go to Resource button. This will take us into the details of that database. Now, one of the things that you might notice is that the server name is a fully qualified domain. I'm going to copy that to the clipboard. It's a fully qualified domain because it's in a public cloud service, and we have to get to it from anywhere. I'm going to paste that into SQL Server Management Studio, enter in that SA username and password, and try to connect. Even though it is a public cloud service, Microsoft recognizes we wouldn't normally put a SQL server outside of our firewall, out in the DMZ. So they've done the exact same thing for us. They put it behind a firewall. And now we've gotten this error where it lets us know that we can't connect to this database because our IP address isn't recognized by the firewall. Now we can sign into our Azure subscriptions right here and configure this, but I imagine most of the time we'll configure this from scripts or the portal. So I'm going to go over to the Azure portal, click on Set Server Firewall. When I do that, it will show me all of the firewall options, and you'll see that I don't have any firewall rules configured. It tells me my current IP address, and it gives me a button at the top, Add Client IP, and that will add a rule to the list. I can give the rule a name so I don't forget about it in the future. I could even widen the IP range if I wanted to allow more than my single IP address, and then I can save it. Once I'm done configuring my firewall policies, then I can go back to SQL Server Management Studio. I can attempt to connect to the database again. It will authenticate my credentials, authorize my permissions, and authorize me to see and work with this database. And I can manage the SQL Server schema and objects from SSMS just like any other database, regardless of where it is. Congrats, you made it to the end of the Getting Started with Azure series. I hope you've enjoyed these videos and learned how you can quickly get started with Azure. Before I wrap up, I'd like to invite you to join me at our weekly Azure Live Q&A session. During the 30-minute session, I will host an interactive and live Q&A to answer your Azure questions.